Welcome, everyone, to the seventh annual Midsummer Night Science and to tonight's topic, A Road to Vital Therapy. Um, my name is Vivian Siegel. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here at the Broad Institute, and it's my honor and pleasure to be hosting this series. Um, as many of you know, if you're repeat visitors to the Broad in the summer, Midsummer Night Science is an annual lecture series that explores key advances in genomics and medicine. It's a series we hold each summer on Wednesday nights in July, and it's free and it's open to the general public. And that means people who are curious about science, students of all ages, our neighbors in Cambridge and Boston and beyond, and people in Kendall Square who are just curious. And for all of you who are just interested in the topic, want to know more about where medicine is going and where new therapeutics are going, welcome. Um, so just as out of curiosity, this is my first year actually hosting Midsummer Night Science. I'm curious how many of you have been to Midsummer Night Science in the past, if you could just give me a show of hands. So we've got a lot of regulars here. Um, welcome back. And how many people f for whom this is the first time you've ever been? Wow. <laughs> That's really exciting. Um, so welcome. I really hope you find the evening interesting. I'm really excited by tonight um, and that you'll come back for other events in this series and to more public lectures at the Broad and at our partner institutions. Um, we do record all of these events, so for those people who can't come in person to every event who are interested in the topics but aren't living in the area, we do make them available on our website and on YouTube as soon as possible after the event is over. Um, so just know that everything here is being recorded for that purpose. Also, we have some people who are tweeting in the audience, and you're welcome if you're a tweeter to tweet. Um, the hashtag is Broad Talks, B-R-O-A-D Talks, um, if you want to tweet about tonight's lecture during the lecture. So tonight's a really special event in the series. Um, it's the first time we've ever done something like this. We usually invite a single speaker to talk about the work that they've been doing, discoveries they've made, and then have some questions from the audience. Tonight, as you know, we actually have five um, leaders um, in the field of therapeutics here as panelists to engage in discussion, although they won't all be presenting today. Hopefully, they'll all contribute to the discussion. Um, and because there are so many panelists, I'm not going to take any time at all introducing them. We've printed out bios of all of our panelists, and I hope you've picked up a sheet for that and you can read about them. And I'll just mention a few words about how uh, tonight will go. Um, we've decided we'd start tonight with a short uh, talk by the director of the Center for the Science of Therapeutics, Stuart Schreiber. He'll speak for about 15 minutes, um, and we're... You're, we're as I said, we're very interested in discussion. If, you, if something is confusing during his talk, by all means, raise your hand. I'll have this microphone, um, and we'll be able to get you to, at, you know, if you have some questions, you're welcome to ask them. But because this audience is very general, um, lots of different people with different backgrounds here, um, I'd like to ask that we let Stuart get through his opening remarks, because they're really trying to set the context for the discussion we hope we have afterwards. And then afterwards, Discussion. I hope there'll be lots and lots of time for that. Um, the, the time here will extend until about uh, 7 o'clock, and then there will be a reception afterwards. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to an exciting time. Um, we do want to give everyone an opportunity who, wa who wants to ask a question, an opportunity, particularly young people, people who are curious about science in the audience. So we've, we're offering you three ways to ask questions. You can raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you like that. Um, you can use Twitter and tweet a question to um, Broad Talks, and someone, and someone in the audience has agreed to actually let me know when those questions happen, or you can email your question to midsummer at broadinstitute.org, and I will be monitor monitoring those questions. So there are lots of different ways to ask questions afterwards. Um, so just... Uh, so that's where it goes. Um, just as a reminder, one more time, this is, a, this is a, a public discussion, and so I've asked Stuart to keep his comments at this point really very general. Um, if you guys have some really, you know, the aficionados in the audience have some really sophisticated questions um, that you really want to get at these panelists about, you will have time to do that during the reception, so I hope we can keep the conversation going and open to everyone. So without further ado, Stuart. Thank you.
Vivian, thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Broad Institute. Um, we're very, really thrilled that you would take your time and um, have this discussion with us. My colleagues and I, who are standing here, you'll get to meet them a little bit, um, would like to engage you in a discussion about how we might discover new, safe, and effective therapeutics in the future. And to frame this discussion, what I'd like to do is share with you the two basic principles that underlie what we're doing here at the Broad at this uh, Center for Science of Therapeutics. So the first one is that in order to gain the knowledge we need to treat disease effectively, we need to learn from patients, what I've called human biology. And the second one is that we're going to have to innovate chemistry and chemical biology in order to achieve success. So let me contrast this approach with the way drugs are currently being discovered. So the first step in any drug discovery effort involves what's called target selection. This means selecting a therapeutic target, generally it's a protein, that you believe, if you had a drug that modulated the protein, would be safe and efficacious for a person with a particular disease. Now, how do we pick these targets? Because this is the very first step. It's important to get the first step right. Generally speaking, we infer from experiments involving test tubes and cells and often what are called model organisms, like flies and mice, that we hope will report on will we'll predict something about human biology and human disease. After selecting that therapeutic target, there's a lot of hard work. Things called medicinal chemistry, which means actually making the candidate drug, and then testing the hypothesis in humans, which we do in clinical trials. Now, if we're lucky, and things work the way we hope, You'll measure the effect of the drug, you'll change the, the concentration of it in patients, and you hope that at low concentrations, there will be an efficacious response. The patient will be better, become well. We hope that there's no toxicity associated with the drug, but if there is some toxicity, that it's only seen at very high concentrations. So you can give the patient the right dose have an efficacious response without a toxic response. And you need that margin of safety. So that's what we're looking for. Remember, the blue curve, we want it to be far over to the left. So we can look back in the last 40 years or so and ask, how are we doing? And the problem, it's a daunting problem. It's a, it's a very big challenge. It's why making effective drugs is so difficult. But if I even ignore all of the challenges associated with these first two steps that sometimes take you know, 10, 15 years to get to the point of testing the, the hypothesis in humans and just look at what happens when we get to the stage of testing the hypothesis in humans, these clinical trials, all too often, greater than 90% of the um, attempts result in failure. We know the two primary modes of failure. The first one is that the drug gets into the body, but it's not efficacious. It doesn't make the patient better. Possibly it has some effect, but it's at too high of a concentration to be practical. The second major failure mode is that the drug gets into the body and has some toxic effect toxic to the liver or to the heart, things we didn't anticipate. And if at a low concentration the drug has a toxic effect, then it doesn't even matter if it's efficacious. We can't even use it. The bottom line with such a high failure rate and a lot of time and effort to get to this point is that we're not very good at picking therapeutic targets. And these models of human biology, like flies and mice, are not faithfully reporting on real human biology and real human disease. So we need, point number one, 
better ways to select therapeutic targets. So this is where human biology comes in and looking at patients. We have this amazing ability today to sequence genomes, human genomes, with extraordinary efficiency, despite the complexity of the human genome. So this experiment involves first looking at a patient population, individuals with the disease and without the disease, cases and controls, looking at the DNA of those patients and looking for variation in the DNA. Because although we all have the same set of genes, each individual gene could be slightly different, a few nucleotides of difference between one person in this audience and another. So the key here is to correlate the variance of the genes with the disease. And because there are multiple variants that correlate with disease, and some of the variants have a weak effect, some of them have a strong effect, we can actually get essentially a dose response. Not of the drug, because there is no drug yet, but of the effect of modulating a potential drug target. And it's the first time this has ever happened before. It's the first time we can turn this whole thing around and learn in advance of even starting a project how a real human might respond. So does this work or is it hypothetical? Well, there's somewhere in between because we, there aren't a lot of examples of this actually driving successfully a new therapeutic discovery effort. But what we can do is look retrospectively. We can say, for example, in the area of cardiovascular disease, where we have some pretty good therapeutics today, good medicines, what would happen if we had this knowledge of genetic variation in the human population? So I'll bet you, some of you in this audience, especially those of you closer to my age, um, may be taking a therapeutic to address cardiovascular disease. I take statins, all right? Statins are drugs that target a therapeutic protein called HMGCR. The statins lower cholesterol levels. And we know that lower cholesterol levels decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So Low cholesterol levels, low risk of disease. The statins lower the cholesterol level and target this protein. Well, it turns out that there are gene variants of this HMGCR in the human population, and some of them have weaker effects, some of them have stronger effects, some of them cause lowering of cholesterol, some of them raising of cholesterol, and we can ask what's the frequency of cardiovascular disease in those patients. And you essentially get a dose response. You get more activity of HMG, CR, and less activity, and you can see the effect on cardiovascular uh, disease. Now, this is a very timely story. I actually picked this example several days ago to show you, not knowing that Gina Colada, the writer for the New York Times, was going to um, provide a story this morning. For those of you who read your New York Times, um, rare mutation ignites race for cholesterol drug. She was actually writing about this exact story. So if you go back to the New York Times today, you can get a little um, further background behind this. And she talked about a different gene, not HMGCR, but something called PCSK9. And there are other genes on this path, like FH, where in the human population there are variants of these genes that either have a lot of activity or little of activity. They lower, they raise the cholesterol, they lower cholesterol and they accordingly alter the risk of cardiovascular disease. And her article was about PCSK9, where gene variants that have low activity have result in very low levels of cholesterol, LDL, the bad cholesterol, and very low levels of risk of cardiovascular disease. So we call these experiments of nature. They're natural modulations of candidate therapeutic targets. We have a project, we have a number of projects like this at the Broad, and I was just going to pick one of them. It happens to be in a completely different area, inflammatory bowel disease, a specific form of it called Crohn's disease. And this project is a collaboration, as many of the projects are here at Broad. It involves uh, Dr. Romnick Xavier, some of you may know, is the chief of gastroenterology at Mass General Hospital. David Altshuler is the deputy director of the Broad Institute. Ali Shamji, you're going to hear from a little bit later, one of our panelists who's sitting here. 
And this is a project that has been generously supported by the Leona Helmsley Charitable Trust. In this project, we would like to discover therapeutics, medicines to treat Crohn's disease, this inflammatory bowel disease. And so, following this path that I just described, cases and controls, humans with the disease, Crohn's disease and without, were studied. Their DNA was analyzed. And sure enough, we found gene variants of a number of genes. I'm just going to talk about one of them. It's got this funny name, CARD9. Some gene variants that increase the risk of Crohn's disease, others that decrease the risk, that protect you against getting this disease, Crohn's disease. Now, the next step I didn't tell you about, but I'll illustrate here. What you now need to know is what are the molecular consequences of these gene variants? And so it turns out that this protective one that we're really interested in is different from the normal one or even the risk one, as far as we can tell, largely by lacking one particular interaction between these two proteins, the green one and the blue one. So we now know that there are fellow citizens walking around their entire lives have never had an interaction between this green protein and the blue one, but the most of us do have this interaction. We're at greater risk of Crohn's disease. They're protected from it. We, we also look into the electronic medical records, and we ask, People with this rare protective variant, do they have any other untoward effects? This is how we get at predicting toxicity. Now, looking at electronic medical records is a little bit challenging because different hospitals have different medical records. I actually put a little um, announcement up there I forgot to mention, but some of you with good eyes saw it. Last month, um, there was an exciting announcement on the creation of a global alliance to enable responsible sharing of genomic and clinical data. This is 70 different organizations, including the Broad Institute, who are participating to try to really make this whole approach even more powerful by not having to go hospital to hospital and ad hoc find out medical records to see whether a gene variant would also predict efficacy or toxicity, but to look it up in the cloud in some safe way. This hypothesis then suggests that if we can make a drug, a small, a, a therapeutic agent that binds the normal protein that most of us in this room have, but simply prevent this green protein from interacting with it, we might prevent and even treat Crohn's disease. This is an example of a human biology hypothesis driven approach to therapeutics discovery. So let me summarize what I've said thus far. In that Crohn's disease case with the gene CARD9, we start with patients. From patients, we go to genes, these experiments of nature. From genes, we identify therapeutic targets. We still have to understand the defect of the risk ones and the protective quality of the protective ones, that molecular characterization, and then Repair the defect with a therapeutic agent using chemistry and chemical biology. Sounds simple. Sounds like we got it, right? Well, here's the problem. <laughs> the problem is these things like CARD9 that are emerging from human biology are very unfamiliar to the therapeutic discovery process. These are therapeutic targets that you wouldn't have picked if you wanted to do something simple, because no one's made a drug against a thing like CARD9. And actually, human biology keeps doing this over and over and over. It makes very unfamiliar targets for therapeutics discovery. And so the excited Broad scientist says, I found my disease gene. But the experts may say, sorry, it's not druggable. So. Um, <laughs> Glass half full, glass half empty. We like to be inspired from Muhammad Ali when he came back from winning his Olympic gold medal and took on Sonny Liston, and everyone said, that's impossible. You can't do that. We don't know whether undruggable means it can't be done, or we haven't figured out how to do it. So this is part two. This is the second pillar, the second principle that we formed around. We need better ways to drug these therapeutic targets revealed by human biology. So what's the problem? Here's the challenge. 
Things like CAR9 are great big molecules. We call them proteins. They have very odd shapes, and they have oddly shaped pockets within them. If you zoomed in here, you'd see a little one here, a little one here, a little one here. There's very complex three-dimensional little pockets that drugs could fit into to modulate this protein to, for example, prevent that green protein from interacting with it. Here's the obstacle. Therapeutics discovery up to this point in time, last 40 years ago, have largely started with drug candidates that are the ones that chemists can easily access. And it turns out, historically, the way to access candidate compounds, we call these, by the way, small molecules. And if you look at the relative size, you can get a sense of why they're small. They're just a lot smaller than the, the target that we're going after. But these molecules are largely flat, two-dimensional. The pockets we need to get them to fit into, three-dimensional. So here's what we hope is a potential solution. In the last several years, just like there's been a revolution in DNA sequencing, there's been a revolution in chemistry. And chemists can now make very different kinds of structures, small molecules, that are much more three-dimensional, and therefore, hopefully, more able, these oddly shaped molecules may be more able to fit into these oddly shaped pockets. So at Broad, we've synthesized 100,000 of these, and we're using these new kinds of compounds in therapeutics discovery as a major driver coupled with human biology. To summarize, therapeutics discovery is very difficult, will continue to be difficult for many years to come, but we're we know that the challenge is that we don't know where to aim, and we're excited that human biology is shining a bright light on the right therapeutic targets. And we know that those targets may be difficult ones, but we're really optimistic that chemistry and chemical biology is providing new opportunities to find the right drugs. Um, many of us here have been at the Broad for, for, from the beginning. We're very proud of the Broad. It's a unique environment. Um, one of the things that's unique is when we started on day one, we established our mission statement to propel the understanding and treatment of disease. So we are very mission focused. We want to impact on human health. It's taken a long time and a lot of effort and we're still not where we want to be. But this past year was an exciting one. We created the Center for Science of Therapeutics and I'll just say that I think it was the right time. We got it, got to this point where we said it's really time to go all out and bring these tools together. And we focused on some of the hardest problems in medicine, autoimmunity, psychiatric disease, cancer, diabetes, infectious disease, and cardiovascular, as I mentioned. That's my little introductory overview, these two principles. I wanted to try to frame a discussion, and we really hope that we can engage you listen to your thoughts and your questions, and have a good interaction with you. And I'm going to ask my colleagues here at the Center for Science of Therapeutics, if they would, to come on up to the uh, table here and make yourself available to some questions. They're very shy, as you can see. <laughs> All right, so we're ready for your questions. Anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Anyone on this panel will try to direct it appropriately. You may not know what they want. Thank you. Uh, so in the case of the Crohn's disease, you, have, you had your red protein or whatever in the green protein. Um, and uh, in people who are surviving, they can either interact or not interact, which to me suggests that there may very well be other proteins black or whatever, uh, that they're also interacting with. And yet, if you want to take a rational approach to drug discovery, and you don't know what these other, other protein, uh, well, I'm just saying protein. I, I don't know what, what, what kind of macromolecule. How do you deal with that in a rational way? Is, is that a, a major obstacle or not? I think I'll have to uh, ask Ali Shamji, who's uh, intimately involved in this project, to take that question. <coughs> I mean, you raise a really excellent point that um, there's many possible parts that could be playing a role in what's causing the disease or protecting from the disease in that particular instance. Um, the approach that was taken was a more unbiased one. Asked the question of 
of the pro what proteins in the cell bind specifically to the risk version versus the protective version. And that, that led to a list. So there were more than one. But then what happens after that initial discovery is some more sort of stepwise, careful biological investigation to ask which one, which interaction is sufficient to disrupt, to be able to, for example, prevent uh, secretion of inflammatory mediators from immune cells. So at, at following the initial discovery, we undertake more mechanistic experiments, you could say, to ask of the candidates that have come out of this perhaps initial fishing expedition, which are the ones that appear to have a function on immune cells. And from that, we narrow into a, a more specific one to pursue for targeting as a drug. But, but you, you, drug. Were, you were right in anticipating. I really simplified the story. There are other ones. There are the, the black ones. And, and I think we're feeling confident that we got a pretty good catalog of what they are. But as Ali said, there's the one bad actor that's fitting all of the pieces of the puzzle to say, that's the bad one. This is the slow part. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it sounds like you have 100,000 small molecules in order to test whether they fit into the various holes or components in the uh, protein. Um, does that mean that at this point we don't have a good enough understanding of chemistry where we can say we want this structure with these binding properties uh, and therefore create the appropriate small molecule? And how, how soon do you think we might have that if we don't yet have it? Sure. So um, I'll take that question. I'm Mike Foley, director of the uh, therapeutics platform, which is responsible for making the compound collection. In some cases, we do know the structure of the protein, and we can use very sophisticated computer modeling to help us design a compound that's going to fit into a particular cleft or binding uh, position on a protein. In many cases, say for the protein-protein interactions, the green and the purple that Stuart showed, sometimes these are very flat kind of surfaces. And it's almost like you're trying to get a grain of sand between two pieces of glass to keep them from coming together in a, a very precise way. And right now, we don't have the ability to predict what structures to make. So, as Stuart pointed out, we're trying to make more of these three-dimensional type structures to interfere with those interactions. And for that, we just have to experiment by maybe going back to what's worked historically, natural products that tend to be more three-dimensional in their structure versus the flatter compounds that are easier for chemists to access. And so under Stuart's leadership, we've undertaken this effort to make the more three-dimensional structures. But be sure, we know how to make those compounds. Synthetic chemistry is advanced to a point where we can make these compounds in an economically feasible way. It's just having the courage to make that upfront investment in chemistry. And the Broad has been one of the few places to do that. I think maybe one point to add here also is that in some cases, when we are pursuing drug discovery projects, we have a specific protein in mind. There is a particular target that we want to pursue. In other cases, the the particular target may be um, unknown to us, but the genetics has suggested a process that we know we want to interfere in. For example, in inflammation, we may know that we may want to cause immune cells to stop producing a certain inflammatory mediator, but we might not know what the right target to accomplish that is. In those cases, we'll what we call screen, meaning in using robotic systems, we'll check each of those 100,000 compounds for their ability in cells to stop producing that inflammatory mediator. So in that sense, we have to remain some, somewhat unbiased to the types of compounds we make, and we want to make sure we cover a range of structures. OK, I guess this is a related question. Um, you, you got all these new 3D molecules, and you're looking for something that'll fit into this uh, socket that you're looking for. To what extent are you uh, opening a Pandora's box of all kinds of other unknown effects? And to what extent do you have that kind of thing under control with you know, your methods? 
assume we want to take that for selectivity and sure access. I'm happy to. I think anyone on the panel uh, could help with that. I'm Jay Bradner. I'm a cancer doctor by training from Dana-Farber. And um, at the end of my training, I retrained in uh, discovery chemistry here at the Broad and um, was invited back to uh, uh, serve as the uh, associate director of the center. Um, in doing so, I learned that there are other diseases than cancer. I've been just exclusively <laughs> focused on that. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, it turns out to be quite a challenge to account for all of the binding interactions of a small molecule in a complex system, a cell or an animal like a mouse or rat that we use preclinically or a patient when we give them a drug. In fact, the majority of human prescribable drugs that I give to patients have actually never been assessed for their binding spectrum in an unbiased way, a discovery way. Before we advance molecules into patients for the very first time to establish their dose, we make certain measurements against receptors or targets that we know from mistakes over decades of drug discovery to present obvious toxicities, channels that mediate ion traffic of the heart that can arrest your heart. That's good to know about. Uh, targets that might uh, adversely affect the quality of your blood or the integrity of your bowel. So certain measurements are compulsory, and as we advance molecules through the follow-up chemistry, the optimization of these prototypes, um, we do make those measurements. But I will tell you, and it's I think a theme that you'll hear tonight, is that we have a sense that the drugs we have access to today um, are insufficient. And one of the obstacles is that we may not have the technologies needed to find the drugs that we need. And one of those technologies is to exactly account for what you're asking us. And so, working with our colleagues in protein physics, mass spectrometry, um, we've worked very hard to create technologies that allow us to go fishing into the mouse or human proteome and just pull out proteins to learn what are the lucky or unlucky interactions that those molecules bring with them. I'll tell you, sometimes we're pleasantly surprised. We make a molecule for this purpose, and it turns out working for that purpose. I had that experience last year. We made a drug for cancer that targets the memory of a cancer cell, causes the cell to forget that it's cancer. Very cool. Accidentally, it inhibits another protein called BRDT. It has nothing to do with cancer. It turns out that's important for making sperm. And so we studied our molecule as a male contraceptive agent. And it worked. Um, <laughs> thank you, ladies. <laughs> um, so it, it turns out to be opportunistic as well as um, very informative. Great question. The, this is a quick follow-up on that. I've always wondered how you can actually target a specific cell in a specific organ. For example, if there was a small molecule that you knew was very efficacious in, in the liver, but it had very deleterious effects in the kidney or something like that, how do you do specific drug delivery to a certain type of cell or organ? <laughs> I guess I'll get that one. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Brian Hubbard, uh, head of the Therapeutics Projects Groups, which takes on some of these daunting tasks. Uh, historically, I come from the pharmaceutical industry uh, and have worried about things just like that for, for many, many years. Um, it, it's very difficult to selectively target a single tissue type. Oftentimes, uh, historically what's been done uh, is the compounds go where the compounds go, and we keep trying to make better ones in this iterative medicinal chemistry process and hope that we find one that actually hits a little more of what we want and a little less of what we don't want. So we sort of push that blue curve that Stuart showed to one side and the red curve to the other. Now, that has worked in many cases. Um, some tissues like the liver, um, compounds love to go to. Some tissues like the brain, uh, pancreas, spleen, compounds don't want to go to. So, that comes down to where we can apply smart chemistry. So by understanding other things within those cells, other proteins within those cells, other receptors on those cells that are specific to that organ, tissue, or cell type, to take potentially a molecule that works against the target 
and couple it to something that drives it to that specific cell type. Now, this is newly being applied uh, across the industry. Uh, historically, it's been applied with larger molecules, and now it's trying to be applied with smaller molecules. But again, this theme of being smarter in the chemistry that we're doing by understanding the biology that's driving it. Coupling those two together allows us to even conceive of doing this. And we hope that we can actually drive that. Mike, do you want to? Yeah, just in this theme, it, it's really important. And so embarrass Stewart a little bit. In part of his career, Stewart worked to synthesize a molecule called FK506, a very complex natural product. And in the process, understood the function of a protein called FKBP12, which is involved then in the immune response and led to uh, the discovery or understanding of how immunosuppressive drugs like rapamycin work. And in that process, Stuart and others, as they understood uh, the role of FKBP12, found out that there's a massive concentration of this particular protein in red blood cells. And you can take a small portion of this very complex natural product called FK506, and just this one piece of it binds to that protein FKBP. And so what we're doing now is taking this small portion of the natural product and attaching it to malaria drugs so that we can deliver those malaria drugs to the red blood cells where the parasite lives. The Gates Foundation right now has a goal of getting those malaria drugs <clears throat> to stay in red blood cells for at least one month so they can clear the infection and then keep a patient from getting reinfected immediately with uh, another mosquito bite. And so now being able to use these insights that have come from something completely unrelated, Stuart's seminal work in understanding immune response, is now going to be used to help us hopefully eradicate malaria by attaching this particular ligand to the known malaria drugs, and we've already begun that process now. So it's very exciting, but extremely difficult to target. We'd all love to keep Lipitor in the liver and you wouldn't have the muscle tox, but it's just really tough to do. So. I'll give you one brief little example too. Brian mentioned the challenges of getting drugs into the brain. In some instances, that's fine because your drug, you don't want the drug in the brain. We have colleagues who are devoting their lives to tackling probably the hardest problems in medicine, those of brain disorders, both neurodegenerative and especially psychiatric diseases. There, almost certainly, the drugs are going to have to get into the brain. Mike's team learned about these basic principles of the brain uses to keep drugs out that Brian alluded to and made a set of compounds, actually substantial set, about 20,000 of them, that have these properties that get into the brain. He then tested them in behavioral studies and in animals, and indeed, this, this smart chemistry allowed those compounds to get in the brain, and we're really excited about those compounds driving our aspirations now in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, among others. Uh, I have a question about cancer and uh, targeting the cancer target has been some quite impressive success. However, the target mutates and the drug then no longer works. I'd like to know how the center is thinking about this problem in terms of long-term um, remission for a cancer patient. Yeah. I'm happy to start that conversation. Um, I will say that what you describe is the central focus of, of my research lab. Um, and uh, as I was training as an oncologist, it was right on the heels of the successful development of Galivac, imatinib, the drug uh, from Novartis for chronic myeloid leukemia, a drug that um, by selectively targeting the cancer-causing gene in that leukemia has kept patients alive for 10, 15 years, taking a pill once a day where just the very year before we would perform stem cell transplantation on those patients, and half of them would, would not survive. So this has really reset our expectations, and more importantly, our patients' expectations about chemical technology and how it can help them. And I, and I suppose we thought that as the human genome was being sequenced here, that as it was applied to cancer genomes, which we're, we're now seeing that data for the very first time in our patients as they walk in the door, that we would, by knowing all the mutations in their genomes, the changes that led to having cancer, that we would make drugs for each of them and enjoy those successes. Um, but the data is very scary. 
Uh, so far, we've observed, as a community, more than a million unique mutations in cancer genomes in 24,000 genes, which is all of them. Um, now, many of these are passenger mutations, the effects of chewing tobacco or cigarette smoking or, or breathing oxygen or having bad luck. But at least 480 of them can contribute to the pathogenesis of cancer, and 149 are known cancer-causing genes. So that's our to-do list. As a community, us working very hard to help industry, don't perceive this effort as us against them. We would do anything to help these companies make better drugs. Um, how many targets do you think we have drugs for? It's 15, just 15. So if all we did is, ch is chase these rainbows that you described, these alter gene products, we would not only have a lot of work to do and need a lot of molecules, we'd probably need new ways collaboratively or through open source approaches to find new molecules. The challenge is that when we find them, we see these unprecedented responses like melanoma responding to the BRAF inhibitor. It is miraculous, but as quickly as patients respond, they progress. And it's not new mutations, it's the selection of mutations that are already there. What we need then are, as I said before, new technologies, multiple avenues of therapy targeting these pathways, anticipating resistance, and to use these drugs together in the front line and to combine modalities, drug molecules that might be pills with new types of antibodies that we're seeing now uh, that activate the immune response and cause the immune system to recognize the cancer as foreign. So it is going to be quite a challenge to deliver to patients what they rightly expect. Um, but technology by technology, as we provide these active medicines to physicians and clinical scientists, they start to combine them. And, and that's where the curative therapy for leukemia came from. So we're quite optimistic that arming them with active drugs, they'll be able to respond. One last comment, and that is that um, I believe that um, we shouldn't be chasing rainbows, that we can trust the drug companies will make drugs against the somatically altered, the altered genes in cancer. We need to think differently. Since Gleevec, this model of targeted therapy for the altered genes has not delivered adequately for our patients. We have to accept that. Um, the doomsday scenario is that it won't, so then what? There are nodes in the cancer cell that integrate all of this information and cause the cell to keep going and growing continuously. And we've known about some of these targets since 1983, like a gene called MYC, which causes cancer. There's no ambiguity, but there's no MYC drug. Why? People tried very hard in the 80s and 90s with the technologies available to them to make an inhibitor of this undruggable target MYC, and they failed. And that target got a bad reputation. And now, if you work at a drug company and your boss says, I'm putting you on MYC, you assume you're being fired. <laughs> so we've taken that project on. That can be our responsibility. Um, academic scientists know it'll take a generation to find the Higgs boson. And that may not be a good commercial project, but it's perfect for us. So I want to underline one thing that Jay said and preface it by saying that I'm pretty well known as the ultimate uh, glass um, half full personality. But um, yes, the, I think the essence of the cancer problem that you, you, you pointed to is combination therapies. And we need the right drugs to, and figure out the right combinations. But I think a lot of people are encouraged by uh, a kind of model. It's an arguably s simpler one. But in the very early days of therapies against HIV and AIDS, the good news is the right therapeutic target was identified, a thing called protease. Um, drugs were made, and within days, HIV levels plummeted. But if you think resistance in cancer is bad, you should see what happens with a rapidly mutating virus. And within days or weeks, the virus levels were up, and the virus had already mutated to become drug resistant. Some very smart mathematicians modeled what would happen if you had two drugs or three drugs all at the same time. What was the frequency of mutating away to resistance? And the prediction was if you had three, the virus could never mutate away. And that's the basis of what's called HART, highly active retro 
viral therapy in AIDS today, triple combination therapy that's worked remarkably well. We need to get to the right cancer drugs, more than 15, and we need to learn the combinations. But I think with that, there's reasons to be optimistic about cancer, even in our lifetimes. Hello, panelists. Thanks for your time. Um, I know the NIH recently uh, launched a pilot program of finding new therapeutic uses for existing molecules. And now considering, number one, uh, what Dr. Schreiber said about these flat 2D molecules being unable to bind to uh, 3D proteins. And also, too, that Dr. Bradner mentioned that there are alternative uses for these existing molecules. Um, do you find, do you believe that these efforts should be applied elsewhere um, in terms of synthesizing new molecules, or should, are these efforts um, possibly fruitful? Um, I'll, I'll start that, and I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the activity uh, that we're talking about um, is often called drug repurposing, and it, it stems from uh, uh, two avenues. One is this long road that it takes to actually get molecules into humans, and then the lack of efficacy or lack of effect on the disease. And so the, the thought has come out that, well, if we have molecules that are safe and through uh, experiences and exercises such as Jay's, um, there may be roles for these molecules still, which would be wonderful because if we could find a role for one of these molecules in a disease, in a patient population, the timeline to help a patient now isn't 15 years, it's right away because these molecules have already made it all the way into the clinic. So these activities of repurposing, I think, are very important. It's not gonna work for every molecule. It's gonna work for a handful. But for those handful, you're now able to bring benefit to people who couldn't benefit before. So we here at the Broad have an activity. Uh, we're working with uh, one of the major pharmaceutical companies where we've actually, they've actually assembled all of their failed molecules over the last 12 to 15 years and given them to us to apply in our technologies around cancer therapies, around understanding disease pathways such as neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, to see if any of these therapies may actually operate in a new disease space just untested, unasked. And that's what we're undergoing right now. So the short answer is we do, we really like this new um, government-sponsored activity and think that it's a very promising one. Yeah, I, I would just want to echo and well, really underscore something that Brian just said, and, and that is uh, th we repurpose drugs in cancer all the time, so we're, we're used to it. I'm a blood cancers doctor, and, and drug companies didn't set out to cure blood cancers, really. They made drugs for other cancers or antibiotics, and they were too toxic, so they gave them to the cancer doctors. Most of the drugs I prescribe um, were intended for something else. So we, we've been excited about your idea for a long time. We're more excited about it now than ever because in the last 10 years when drug discovery has been target directed, the quality of knowledge around the molecule on the shelf is um, pretty sophisticated. And so if you see an activity of a molecule, you can almost infer what the target um, is doing in that cancer system or cardiovascular system. One thing I'll tell you though is that we're much more excited about the drugs on the shelf than the ones in the pharmacy. And this is a challenge for us as scientists because those drugs are a secret. They're protected. They're um, deeply buried in patent applications or not patented at all. Um, drug companies aren't proud of their failed experiments. I'm not either. Um, we don't often publish our failed experiments. They don't often relieve, release their failed drugs. But we're meeting these companies now who are interested. They know there's gold on the shelf. It didn't work for their first intended target. Can we bring biology to their chemistry? Um, open access to these molecules is essential for this process to work, but um, could give you many examples at the coffee hour of, of where we're already seeing success in the clinic. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and um, I was just thinking about the sociology of medicine 
uh, so often we perhaps overprescribe or patients don't correctly use antibiotics and there may be an increasing rise of or a danger of superbugs. I also think about the, the multiple interactions of medicines that we don't always understand. So I want to ask a, a broad, maybe strategic question as we kind of come to the close of the hour. In terms of your focus on therapeutics, how does it relate to a broader initiative on regenerative medicine? Yeah, what is the partnership between those two initiatives for multiple approaches to solve things? Then how are we safeguarding against the uh, uh, unintended rise of superbugs and other uh, problems we want to avoid? So you've asked a couple of really interesting questions. And um, actually, maybe, Mike, I'll turn it over to, in a minute, to the issue of the uh, resistance and, and, and proper use of drugs. The issue of regenerative medicine is a really interesting one. And it's not actually listed here, per se. But I think that many of these diseases have elements of um, being essentially diseases of cellular deficiency where regenerative medicine could be useful. Um, in the brain disorders, it's not psychiatric, but neurodegenerative Parkinson's disease, we know exactly that there's a certain kind of neuron that's deficient, and there's a very similar kind of neuron that's in abundance. If we could just get that abundant one in Parkinson's patients to switch over, to re regenerate, the deficient one, that would be a revolutionary, a new approach to, to Parkinson's. It's never been done yet, although there are real hints of this happening accidentally in, with drugs that we didn't anticipate, actually within the cancer area. So um, I'm actually excited about learning about the pathways that define one cell type versus another and making those therapeutic targets for regenerative medicine and being able to uh, tackle diseases of cellular deficiency. Mike, how about the question of antibiotic um, overuse, superbugs? Sure, how some of the resistance. I'll defer to Jay on how they're prescribed. I'm a chemist, not a doctor, so you can take the prescription part of it. But one of the things that we've noticed here being at the Broad with the incredible capability to sequence genomes and learn so much about bacteria, um, thanks, um, <laughs> that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, with understanding bacteria better, some bacteria are very good for us, we've co-evolved with them, uh, other bacteria are very bad for us, and so we need to figure out how to selectively kill the MRSA. You'll hear about MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus sweeping through a high school or a hospital ward. Or a big problem in the first world, Clostridium difficile infections, C. diff. And these are local problems here. Local hospitals have these uh, infections running through uh, their wards. And why you get a C. diff infection is because we take broad-spectrum antibiotics that indiscriminately wipe out all the gut flora. And then this sporulating, tough little bacteria, the C. difficile, gets ingested. And there's no competition for it in the digestive tract. It multiplies rapidly and starts pumping out a toxin that it can kill people and oftentimes does. So the key is to take the knowledge that we're gaining at places like the Broad to figure out how to kill C. diff and C. diff only. And we have programs right now that are partnered where we can kill only C. diff and preserve all the other gut flora. And so it's a long road in you know, places like the Broad where you figure out which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, and how do you maintain that proper balance going forward. So we, we have a, a, a big project here at the Broad. We call the microbiome project. I've probably heard about the fact that we're learning that we have these interacting bacterial species in our skin, on our tongue, in our gut, and learning how antibiotics affect that population is pointing to new therapeutic approaches, and I think the C. difficile one is a poster child for what we need to learn how to do in the future that current antibiotics don't allow us to do. I'll just add one point. I, guilty as charged. My patients, I drop blood counts for a living. We shoot first, ask questions later. If a patient has a fever, a little rigor, drop in blood pressure, they get the full Monty of antibiotics. 
we've learned to treat before we diagnose the bacterium, at which point it's difficult to contain. But there's something to what Mike is saying which is actually very modern thinking, and it comes from not having a profit motive. If you're a company, you might want to make one antibiotic to rule them all. Whatever your problem is, you'll take my antibiotic. Um, you wipe out a lot of the flora, and you're unnecessarily exposing bugs that aren't the pathogen to a substance that they may develop resistance to, colonize your gut, which is what we diagnose on the cancer wards, and then later become a pathogen at the moment when you're incapable of fighting it. Narrow spectrum antibiotics, bullets for specific infections allow us to tailor our antibiotic therapy. We'll still give the big blast of antibiotics in the clinic, but after 48 hours when the blood cultures are positive and we know what bug it is, we immediately narrow the spectrum. Clinically, we're working very hard on this problem um, and have every motivation to do it, but we need better tools from the chemists. Well, one, one, just following up on what Jay said about needing better tools from the chemists, one thing Mike didn't mention is that he, he actually leads a, a serious effort here at the Bro to try and discover new antibiotics. And one thing we've emerged, that's emerged from these studies is that the new chemistry really matters. A, a lot of the efforts that Mike's team put into creating this collection are, are paying off now in, in ways that we didn't necessarily expect. To, to give a very specific example, um, Mike's team has discovered a compound with activity in uh, malaria. Um, it targets the same protein, it turned out, as another compound that's already out there for treatment of malaria. But what was surprising is the malaria parasites that become resistant to the existing drug, even though it's the same target, are actually not resistant to the compound that Mike has developed, because the chemistry has led to a different binding site on the, part, on the target um, that is not affected by the other resistance mutations, arguing that there may be a real role for new chemistry to help us, even in some cases with new targets, in some cases with targets that we already understand. Well, it's already after seven, and I can tell there are a lot more questions that we've had time to answer in this room. So I encourage everyone to stay afterwards and continue that conversation with the panelists at the reception. And also, I would say, if you have questions tonight that you aren't able to answer here, feel free to email them to midsummer at broadinstitute.org, and we'll try to work out a way to get those questions answered for you. If I could just have one more opportunity to thank all the panelists and everyone in the audience for an incredible discussion. Thank you very much.